My name is Sarah Angeloff. I attend the Harrisburg campus. I've been married to my husband, Tyler, for about three years, and I'm a special education teacher. I grew up in a house where um, we were spiritual and we had faith, but having a relationship with Jesus wasn't the center. Nothing significant happened that made me walk away from my faith. It just kind of naturally happened as I got older. I started to prioritize other things. So my husband and I got married the summer of 2019, and then the pandemic hit a few months later. At that time is when I kind of started to feel um, nudges from God that, you know, maybe I should be going to church again. And it's something that um, I kind of, I don't want to say ignored for a little while, but just kind of was wrestling with because I did have a lot of anxiety and I wasn't necessarily comfortable you know, going to church in person. But I started watching LCBC online. Um, and then I think that I really started to dive into my relationship with God at that point. So I had been attending LCBC for about six or seven months. And my husband and I had started trying to conceive our first child. We had been trying for about a year and we did some fertility testing and found out that the chances of us conceiving naturally were pretty slim. And that was really, really challenging for me to process. I actually remember the day that I had the appointment with my doctor to kind of go over some test results uh, was the first night of a woman's Bible study here. And I just remember like going into that and everyone was introducing themselves. And at the end, we were talking about prayer requests and in front of a room full of women I barely knew, I just felt like God saying, talk to them about this. So I brought it up and the amount of support I got from strangers on a day that was really challenging was very inspiring to me. Um, and I met some incredible women who struggled with fertility as well. So just being able to have that support at a time when I felt really low, I just know that that was God looking out for me and saying, this is really hard, but I've got you. And I'm gonna put these people in your life to walk this journey with you. There's still days where it's really very hard. I'm still, you know, sad and upset. Um, angry that I don't have a baby, but I've really learned to submit to God those feelings and on those hard days really just pray as hard as I can and recognize all the blessings and prayers that he has answered rather than focusing all my energy on the one prayer he hasn't answered. Looking back, when I started to kind of feel those nudges to go back to church, I think he knew this struggle was coming. He knew our fertility journey wouldn't be easy. And through coming to LCBC, I've met so many women who have been so supportive. I just felt like it was his way of looking out for me in that moment and preparing me for this struggle that was to come. I'm Sarah, and I'm a life changed by Christ. Hey, listen, I um, just want to say thank you, Sarah, for sharing your story. I mean, I just, I love being part of a church where we can be honest that hurt and pain and confusion can live right by side of hope and faith and trust in God's goodness, that we can go through something incredibly painful and still sing how great thou art for all the ways, I'm so grateful for all the ways that God is working in, in so many lives, lives like Sarah's, like so many of your lives right now, leading us into new life as we grow in our relationship with him. It's just an amazing thing to be a part of. Listen, before we, before we jump into what we're gonna be talking about today, I, I just want to, to tell you that next week, and I know you've already heard us talking about this series that's starting next week, Living with Lions, but I just wanna add my two cents to this. Next week, we start a brand new series, Living with Lions, and let me just tell you, just sort of from my perspective, over the last two years, I would say that we've probably, here at the church, we've gotten more emails, 
personal conversations, questions from many of you, from people outside of even in our church, just about culture. And what feels at times like it's going off the rails. And I think we've gotten more questions and inquiries about that in the last two years than we have in the previous 10 years combined. And so we're gonna dive headfirst into this tension of how in the world to make sense of a culture that sometimes feels like it's going off the rails in a lot of ways. When do you take a stand? When do you not take a stand? If you take a stand, how should you take a stand? When is the time to say something? When is the right time to just be quiet? That's what we're gonna talk about. And thankfully, we have a guide named Daniel who discovered how to live in a culture that was in far, believe it or not, far worse shape than ours. And yet he maintained hope and humility and wisdom through it all. And we are going to discover how to do the same thing. You're gonna wanna be there. And I promise you, you're gonna wanna bring someone with you as well. It's gonna be great as we dive into that next week. So this week, we're wrapping up our series called Foolproof. And really over the course, we've said all along that the assumption behind this series is that none of us set out to be stupid. That's on none of our vision boards, right? I wanna be stupid. And yet, how many times do we find ourselves doing stupid things? Or is it just me? I know I'm alone in this, right? We need wisdom. Would you agree? We need wisdom. And thankfully, God promises that if we seek wisdom, he'll give it to us. And so this month, we've been working through the book of Proverbs, which is right in the middle of the Bible. It's a collection of wisdom statements written by King Solomon. And we've been looking specifically at a few core areas of our lives that we can learn to live wisely in. We've talked about the area of self-control and the wisdom that living a disciplined and self-controlled life brings with it. Last week, we looked at how we can live a foolproof life in our friendships. And by the way, let me just say this about last week. Last week, man, I tried my very best to just lay my heart out on the floor for you. I mean, just put it all out there. I tried to make as compelling a case as I possibly could for us to evaluate our friendships and ask if they're leading us towards God's intent for our life or maybe dragging us away from God's intent for our life. I just tried to, with passion and clarity, put it all out there. And when I was done, the only thing that people wanted to talk to me about, it wasn't friendships, it was Bucky's. which made me so proud of you, man. I love my church, love my church. Listen, if you have no clue what I'm talking about right now, you missed last week, go check out last weekend and just listen to Bucky's story. All right, but I ended last week, if you were here last week, I ended last week by saying that this weekend we were gonna talk about a superpower that all of us have that this superpower, how we use the superpower can be the difference between life and death for the others around us. And that's what I wanna talk about today. I wanna to talk about that superpower and how I think we very rarely consider how we use it. And you know what it is? It's our words. It's our speech. It's the words that we use. The way we speak to and the way we speak about other people. You can't even begin to talk about leading a foolproof life without talking about the role that our words play in it. In fact, may or may not know this, in the book of Proverbs, other than the topic of wisdom itself, there is no other topic that's covered more than our speech and the words that we use. And Solomon actually tells us why this is the case by making this remarkable statement right in the middle of the book of Proverbs that I think just gives us such a burden for why we have to talk about this. This is what Solomon said, Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue, that's our speech, our words, the tongue can bring death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. In other words, use enough words for long enough and it's going to land, it's either going to rob people of life or bring life out of people. Bring people to life or rob people of life. Just think about the categories that we're given here for where our words can land. Life or death. That's a pretty extreme statement. Life or death. This This is about a strong way of saying that our words matter that there are words that we can use that will fall into either one of these two columns, that it breathes life into the person on the receiving end of those words or it will rob them of life. Our words can build up, our words can tear down. Our words can inspire, our words can deflate. Our words can encourage, our words can discourage. And man, we cling to life-giving words, don't we? When we, when we are in the receiving end of life-giving words, we cling to those things. How many of you can recall the words that someone spoke to you maybe years ago and you still hold on to them? They still bounce around in your heart because they were so encouraging. 
something you were dealing with, something you were going through, and they just, they sparked creativity, they sparked inspiration in you, they gave you confidence, and you haven't forgotten it. How many, of you have, how many of you have ever gotten a text or a note or a voicemail that was so life-giving you read it a second time or a third time or a tenth time or you held on to it? Now, why do we do that? Because we intrinsically know what this 3,000-year-old truth means. Words carry the power of life and death. And those words that we cling to, man, they breathe life into us. And yet, let's talk about the opposite side. Words can rob us of life too, right? Things can die and dry up because of words that someone speaks. Dreams have died because someone said it was a stupid idea. Relationships have died because of words spoken. Confidence has died because of something someone said to us again and again. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to over the years who have had life robbed of them by words that were spoken to them, sometimes years and years ago, and it still runs like a tape player playing in their head again and again those words. Guys, listen, I've talked to men in their 60s and 70s who cannot remember much about their childhood, but they can tell you all about the words their father spoke to them that stung and robbed them of life. They can tell you that like it was yesterday. And if you've picked up some life-robbing messages along the way, you are definitely not alone. Research backs this up. In fact, there's a writer and educator, her name is Michelle Borba. She writes that, that there's research out there that's indicated that kids, and I think this is true for everyone, kids hear 18 negative life-robbing statements for every one positive. Let's just think about how that kind of tallies up. 18 negative, 18 ne death life-robbing statements for every one life-giving statement in a day. And that's true for us as adults as well. It doesn't stop because you turn 18. You know, 65% of Americans reported receiving no recognition for good work the past year. Nothing in this column for a year. Only here. The point is this. And I think most of our experiences would back this up and confirm this, that for every I'm proud of you, for every I love you, for every great job on that presentation, for every I cannot imagine a better wife, we hear disproportionately more, that'll never work. What are you, stupid or something? Why are you so lazy? You're so annoying, you're so weak, you're so fat, you're so difficult, you're too much. That's a problem, guys. That is a huge problem. And here's the thing. We have no control over the words that someone speaks to us. But we have control and we have choices over the words we speak. And what tally marks we put on someone else's board. So here's the personal challenge. I'm, I just want to simply ask you today. On which side of that board right there are your words landing with the people around you? And as we'll see, God is actually inviting us to be the kind of people who load up the tally marks on the life-giving side for the people around us. Even today, you're gonna have the opportunity to take one less mark off the life-robbing side and you're gonna have an opportunity to move it to the life-giving side with someone you interact with. I promise you by the end of the day, and if you're interested in being the kind of person who's foolproof in the way that you use your words, Solomon gives us three areas, three real simple areas that we're gonna, we're gonna have to be mindful of related to our words. And he just paints such a compelling vision for the way that God intends us for us to use our words. So I just wanna talk about those three areas. You're gonna have to be mindful of this. Do you wanna be foolproof in the area of your words? Here's three things you're gonna have to keep in mind. First is this, this is Proverbs 26, 18. Through 19. I love this imagery. He says, just as damaging as a madman shooting a deadly weapon is someone who lies to a friend and then says, I was only joking. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever said something and literally as those words are coming out of your mouth, you already regret them? 
And it's like the train has left the station though. It's like coming out, you're like, I wish I could just put these all back in right now, but I keep going. I just keep, blah, 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 right? And then you try to pass it off because you couldn't, you couldn't put it back in your mouth. You try to like, oh man, you know what? Well, it's just a joke. It doesn't mean anything. This is why Solomon, by the way, talks about our words being like arrows. Remember he said it was like a madman shooting a deadly weapon. He's referring to arrows there. Because when you speak a word, you can never make it as if that word weren't spoken. Every time you open your mouth and you speak a word, it's like you're pulling back that word and you're about to shoot that thing. The arrow has flown. And you can't put that arrow back in the bow. So you know what this proverb is about? It's all about restraint. Because the best way to ensure that the arrow of your words doesn't do any damage to the person receiving in is, you want it, the best way to avoid that is? Never shoot it. Never shoot it. Because once it flies, the damage is done. It's funny because we talk every now and then about putting a filter on our words. You ever heard someone say that? Like, dude, just, you need a filter, right? But what's crazy is that that idea of having a filter, that's not just a metaphor. We've literally, physically been, giving a, been given a God-given filter for our tongue. You know what it is? It's our mouth. Can you do this real quick, everybody? Um, just do it real quick. Um, everybody, every canvas. Um. See, your filter works. <laughs> it works. <laughs> when my kids were young, I don't know if you had this problem, if you got kids or grandkids or whatever, but when my kids were young, we had a serious smacking problem when we would have meals together. I mean, it was bad. And it's kind of a pet peeve of mine, I'm not gonna lie. Like if someone's smacking around me, like we're in the car, whatever, I'm rolling down all the windows, I'm cranking up the music. I don't care if it's We Don't Talk About Bruno. I'm cranking it. Like, it doesn't matter. I can't do it. I'm like, find a happy place. You know, that's me with, with smacking. And, and we said, what, if you've ever kind of had to address that in your home with your kids, we said something probably a million and one times in our home when my kids were little, and it was this. Please, chew with your mouth Closed. Someone last night said, shut. I was like, that's an aggressive person. I like that. <laughs> Chew with your mouth closed. You know what Solomon is saying here? Just think with your mouth closed, man. <laughs> Not every thought you have needs to be said. That, that sticks to some of you right now. Saying nothing is so much better than saying something that chips away because you let that arrow fly. And we can all do this. I know your filter works. You've already proven that. But I also know that you don't have to, you know, open your filter up because you know how I know? Because I've seen you. I've seen you in Target when your kid's having a meltdown. I've seen you at a restaurant when there's tension. And you know what? You were settled. And you didn't blow up because you wanted to make sure that you, that didn't happen in that public setting you didn't react, your filter can work. And honestly, guys, if we could just get this one simple little idea right here down, just think with your mouth closed, man, how much damage would be avoided in our relationships just by doing that? How many apologies would never have to be given? How many wounds would never be inflicted? Because here's the thing, man, once that arrow flies and it lands, that arrow may not always be there, but the scar will be. And Solomon's saying, man, you want a foolproof life when it comes to your words today? When, when you have the chance to let that arrow fly, sh just shut your mouth, literally, because a foolproof person thinks with their mouth closed. But then Solomon actually gives us the flip side of this idea. I love what Solomon says next. This is in Proverbs 25, 11. He says, timely advice is lovely. It's like golden apples in a silver basket. <laughs> it's like golden apples. I got a golden apple. It's like a golden apple in a silver basket. The, the Proverbs talk in multiple places about the timing. This is all about the timing of our words. What's he saying? He says, timely, your timely words, right? It's like a golden apple. He's saying that there are there is a right thing said at the right time that can actually provide us with nourishment. When the right thing is said at the right time, it, it's like being fed golden apples. Not just apples, golden apples. It gives you value and nourishment. 
It's like nourishing the hungry. A foolproof person will consider what words are good for what time. We have to learn restraint on life robbing words, but there should be no restraint on life giving words. Because people around us need to be fed the golden apples, right? They need to be fed words of life. So here's a principle to remember if you're wanting to know, well, then when's the right timing to give someone life-giving words? I'll tell you, it's kind of simple. If you think it and it's positive, say it. Now's the right time. If you think it and it's positive, say it. This is the opposite of the filter because you know these words will bring life. Guys, how many times do we have a positive thought about someone? Something that we're grateful for about that person, that neighbor, that family member, that friend, whatever. Something that we noticed something that we're proud of, proud of them about. We think it, but we never say it. How many times does that happen? Be impulsive and indiscriminate with life-giving words. If you think it, and it's positive, then say it, text it, write it, speak it. Pull your car over and text it right away. Don't keep encouragement locked up in your head. Because if you do, you starve the people around you from the life-giving words. Those golden apples, man, they're waiting for nourishment. I mean, I've just found that for the most part, there, there's one event that you can almost guarantee that people will finally say all the life-giving words that they have stored up about that person. You know what that event is? Yep, funeral. There's only one problem with that. I mean, what good is it? to bring golden apples to feed someone who's already gone. And parents, let me just, parents, you just lean in for a moment. Let me just talk to you real quick. You know, your kids are hungry for your words. Your kids have an insatiable appetite for life-giving words, as we all do. And their appetite was intended by God to find its fulfillment in you. They need you to give them the golden apples, to nourish them. And if we starve our kids, and here's the, here's the risk, guys. If we starve our kids of life-giving words, I promise you, they're going to go look for them somewhere else and from someone else. But you can't guarantee the people they'll go looking for that life-giving words from will have their best interests at heart. They're word-hungry. They're gonna go where they think the life is and it is our job as parents to fill our kids up with life-giving words so they never have to question where they stand with us and what we feel about them. Listen, if you're in the marketplace, if you're a boss, if you're a CEO, if you've got coworkers, if you work in a division, you've got coworkers, this is all, you know, for so many of us, your coworkers are word-hungry and you can change the whole tone of your workplace by seeing each conversation and interaction as a, a moment to bring life with your words. Your spouse is word hungry and has a desire to hear words of life spoken over her, spoken over him, words that build up. And one of the most surefire ways that we can begin to move the marks in our own life from the side to the life, from the life robbing side to the life giving side is to commit to this simple idea that if I think it, and it's positive, I'll say it. No filter on that. So if we wanna live a foolproof life in the way that we use our words, we have to think with our mouth closed. We've gotta be impulsive and indiscriminate in our encouragement. And then Solomon gives us one more area to pay attention to. This is what Solomon says in Proverbs 25, 15. He says, patience can persuade a prince and soft speech can break bones. I love that last line. Soft speech can break bones. Now, I got a bone right here. I don't think it's a human bone, although no one could really guarantee that when I was given, given it. Um, well, it may be a human, but I don't know. <laughs> so anyways, it's a femur. You know that one cubic inch of bone in principle can bear a load of 19,000 pounds? That's roughly the weight of five standard pickup trucks, making it about as, four times as strong as concrete. And in the ancient Hebrew world, the bone was a symbol of hardened resistance in someone's spirit. Today, we might actually talk about someone, you ever heard this phrase like, well, they just had their walls up. 
They got a wall up. That's kind of what it's describing. When, when you say that someone has their walls up, it's like saying, man, they're just kind of hardened to everything. They, they got a resistance up. There's a resistance to it. And Solomon is saying that there's a way of speaking to someone that if we pay attention to it, it can have such an effect on the listener that it can actually break bones. It can break down walls. But the key will be in how we say the things that we want to say. See, this passage is all about tone, isn't it? It's the tone of our words. Notice what he says. It's about soft speech. The focus is on softness. There are words that we can use that given in the wrong tone can actually rob life from the people around us. It's not the words themselves. It's the tone in which they're spoken. You can say it like this. The, the right thing said the wrong way makes it the wrong thing. In other words, how you say something is at times more important than what you say. And that will determine whether or not the person can actually hear what you're saying. Years ago, I was in Africa. I was in Kenya. And we were uh, visiting some of the, we were visiting one of the communities that our church has partnered with. And, you know, we partner with now, it's amazing. We partner with communities all over the world across our church. We sponsor over 7,000 children here at our church to see God do works in some of the most impoverished and, and, and in neat countries in the world. And so anyways, we were over in Kenya. We were visiting one of the communities we're involved with, and it was an incredible trip. And at the end of that trip, we had like a day or two of free time. And so we went to a national park there, Amboseli National Park, and it was just an amazing experience. And on the first night that we were there, we had had dinner. I mean, it's just beautiful. Like the sun is setting. We look out, and at the end of dinner, we look down, and there's a hyena that had made its way into the campground, and we're watching this, and everybody's freaking out. I was excited. Last hyena I saw was Lion King, so I was kind of pumped. <laughs> but the Kenyans who were working there, they weren't too happy. I mean, they were kind of nervous for the guests and all that, and so it was kind of getting dark, and and we start to leave, and they shut down all the power at night, so it's getting dark. And so one of the, the Kenyans there, he decides to walk us. We take two steps out of the, the restaurant, and we look down. And guys, there is a centipede that is probably this long, I'm assuming. <laughs> and a billion legs, wings, horns, teeth. I mean, it was sick. <laughs> and we're just looking at these things. But the Kenyan, you could tell the Kenyan... Who's, who's trying to get us back to our places and all that. Like he's, he, he's, he's kind of saying, we need to move on, move on. And so he kind of grabs us while we're looking at saying, and he just looks at me and he goes, not about a row. And I go, huh, can you say that again? Not about a row. Hmm. Uh, centipede, is that what you call centipede? And he goes, no, not about a row. I'm sorry, buddy. We take four steps. He turns around, no matter who. And I go, hyena? Are we talking about the hyena again? Then I think he's talking about my name. I'm like, oh, it's Jason. Is your name no matter who? And he's like, oh, no. I mean, this, guys, 10 minutes, this goes on. <laughs> no matter who. I'm sorry, bud. No matter who. I don't get it, bud. No matter who. Finally, someone in the group raises their hand. They go, I got it. I got it. Number room. He wants to know what number room you're in so he can take you to your room. I was like, <laughs> of course. Namarum. <laughs> Sometimes there's things that people need to hear, but our accent gets in the way of them being able to hear it. And you know, our words, they have accents, don't they? They can have accents. You can speak with an accent of contempt. You can speak with an accent of shame. People will know it. You can speak with an accent of self-righteousness, like you're better. You can speak with an accent of hate. You can speak with an accent of apathy. There's all sorts of accents we use with our words. And all of a sudden, things maybe we wanna say get twisted and turned. I mean, there's a huge difference, isn't there, between me saying, hey, will you be running late tonight? Versus, you gonna be running late tonight? That's an accent. And it says something completely different. There's a big difference between a B, man, great job, versus a B, well, great job. That's what an accent does. Your accent will be what determines whether your words that are neutral 
end up on the life-robbing or life-giving side. And it will determine whether your words are hearable. See, at some point, we have to take responsibility for how people hear us. And I know that I've, every now and then I'll bump into someone and they'll just be like, well, I'm just honest. I just say it like it is. I just speak my mind and if people don't like it, they can just get over it. Which is just a really kind of a code for, yes, I'm a jerk and I know it and I don't want to change. But come on, man, you're better than that. You're so much better than that. And the people around you deserve way better than that. And God has a way better vision for your life and for your words. That words that could actually bring life to people around you because you actually gave thought to how you're saying what you're saying. And too many words and exchanges have been put on the life robbing side of the board because they were said with an accent that made it hard to hear. With tones that did not build up the other person but in a tone that shamed them, tore them down, manipulated them. And guys, listen, if you're serious about being a person who's foolproof, you have to be mindful of how you say what you say and take responsibility for making your words hearable. Guys, listen, God offers such incredible wisdom for living a remarkable life, but at the end of the day, man, God is not after just cleaning up our words and our speech. I hope you know that's not ultimately what God's after. God is after changing our hearts. He wants to change our hearts, to change us into the kind of people who want to bring life-giving words, not have to. That's why Jesus said in Luke 6, he says, out of your heart, your mouth speaks. We need new hearts way more than we need new words. And for some of you, that's where it actually should start today. By just surrendering your heart to Jesus and saying, Jesus, change my heart, make me alive to you so that my words bring life to others. And again, I'll just remind you, here's, here's why it matters so much. That's a problem, guys. That's a problem. But the good news is you get to determine which side of the board your words will end up on for the people around you. And I'm challenging you, and God's word is challenging us today to consider moving the marks, to use every opportunity you can possibly use this week to bring life to others through your words. And here's what's gonna happen as a result. If you took this seriously, if I take this seriously, some of you, you're gonna tell your wife you love her for the first time in years. Today, do not delay. Move Mark. Some of you are gonna tell your husband that you're proud of him for the first time ever. You're gonna move a mark, don't delay. Some of you are gonna tell your parents <clears throat> that you're grateful for what they do for the first time ever, and then they're gonna faint. <laughs> because you moved a mark, don't delay, man. Some of you, you're gonna hold back on criticism of your coworkers. You're gonna put your filter in place and you're gonna move a mark. Some of you, <clears throat> you're gonna for the very first time consider how, how you're saying what you're saying so that it can break down walls. Guys, can you imagine, can you imagine how our relationships would thrive and flourish if we took this wisdom that God provides about our words seriously? If we chose to think with our mouth closed if we chose to be impulsive and indiscriminate with our encouragement, and if we chose to pay as much attention to our tone as we do to the words we're using, the tally marks would shift. And I promise you, the people around you would feel the effect. One of the things my dad's told me multiple times is a story about when he was 21 years old. It was his wedding day, and his father, my grandfather, wasn't able to be at the wedding because he had a serious heart attack a few days before. So he was in the hospital. My dad, you know, finishes the wedding. They get done with the wedding and him and my mom drive over on their way to the honeymoon. They drive over to the hospital to see my grandfather. And my dad can tell you everything about that visit. Not because he was, my grandfather was 
in the hospital. It had nothing to do with that. It had nothing to do with the heart attack. You know why? My dad can tell you everything about that visit. That was the first time that my grandfather ever told my dad he loved him. 21 years without hearing it. I asked my dad a while ago if he can remember the first time he ever threw a football with his, with his dad, and he said, nope. And then I said, do you remember the first time granddaddy, that's what I called him, ever read you a book? He said, no. But he can tell you everything about that day. And you know why. Because on that day, one of those marks moved. And life was given. So let's be foolproof with our words. The words we use. And let's watch people around us come to life as a result. Listen, if you want to pray about anything today, we'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you. If you're in one of our rooms, just come down front, left of the room. There's people who'd love to have that opportunity to pray. Don't forget, next week we start a brand new series, Living with Lions. Man, I hope to see you there. Until that time, LCBC, may the Lord bless and protect you. May the Lord smile on you. May he be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Thanks so much for being here. See you next week.